like to call the Board of Trustees regular meeting for Thursday, October 6, 2022 to order. If everyone can please stand, Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ethan, would you please call the roll? President Ballerine. Here. Trustee Evans. Here. Trustee Galagos. Here. Trustee Clarity. Here. Trustee Marshazga. Here. Trustee Hannon. Here. Trustee Pollock. Here. Village Manager Francis. Here. Village Attorney Mars. Here. Also present, Village Clerk Soul. Thank you. Uh, President's report, I only have one thing on, on the my agenda item tonight, and that is the appointment. Uh, I'd like to ask for a motion to appoint Jacqueline Miller to the Cross Community Climax Collaborative the Sea 4 Sustainability Group, which Riverside has is a signer on to with several other communities. Um, our lead trustees on that is Trustee Aberdeen Marsazga and Trustee Kristen Evans. So, so if I can have a motion. Motion by Trustee Marsazga, second. I'll second. Second by Trustee Galagos. <coughs> Ethan. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Galagos. Aye. Trustee Clarity. Aye. Trustee Marshazga. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Great, thank you. And I'd like to thank Ms. Miller for agreeing to serve on this, this important initiative of the village. Uh, manager's report, Ms. Francis. Thank you. Um, I have a couple items this evening. First, I would like to thank Deputy Chief Frank Lara for providing both the village board and village staff pink ribbons, so you'll notice, for Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Um, it is an annual campaign to raise awareness about the impact of breast cancer. Um, and I want to read something actually from Deputy Chief Lara that he had sent out to village staff. I'm sure each of us knows someone, whether it's a family member, friend, or coworker affected by breast cancer. In an effort to raise awareness, I've decided to hand out free pink ribbons for officers and coworkers to wear, wear during the month of October. Um, he felt it was important to support those affected by cancer and to let them know that they are not alone in this breast cancer journey. And so um, thank you to the board members for supporting him as well and displaying the breast cancer awareness ribbon. And I'd like everyone to know just my father had breast cancer. So this isn't just a female disease. So um, everyone should make sure they're checked. Thank you. Um, additionally, I would like to thank everyone that made Tour de Proviso a success. The event would not have been a success without the work of Director Melchiotti, organizing sponsors, coordinating with the zoo, and Visit Oak Park. Also, Director Buckley to ensure the safety of those participating in the event. Thank you to President Ballerine for working with other communities to bring this wonderful event to Riverside. And finally, thank you to the village trustees Public Works, the Police Department, and Fire Department for their support during this event. My final item is um, some fun items as it relates to parks and recreation. So for those of you that don't know, we have a haunted drive through and if you haven't signed up, there is still time. Registration closes on October 12th at 9 a.m., but don't wait as this has been a very popular event since it was added in 2020 due to COVID. It is also, um, I wanted to note, it is Saturday, October 15th. There are two different time frames that you can participate. One for younger kiddos, which is from 2 to 4 p.m. And for the older group, 4 to 6 p.m. Um, also, Parks and Recreation will be doing the Tower Lighting and Costume Parade around Centennial Park on Wednesday, October 19th at 6 p.m. If you would like to volunteer for the Haunted drive through please contact Parks and Recreation as they are looking for any monsters that would like to participate. That is all I have this evening. Thank you. I think that's the call to you, Alex. <laughs> Um, <laughs> resident comments, uh, non-agenda items. Uh, is there anybody in the public that would uh, like to speak on non-agenda items this evening? 
Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Ethan. Approve voucher list of bills October 6th, 2022. Review and file community development, fire and police August monthly reports. Approve Village Board of Trustees regular meeting minutes September 15th, 2022. Review and file Economic Development Commission special meeting minutes July 14th, 2022. Review and file Landscape Advisory Commission regular meeting minutes August 9th, 2022. Review and file Planning and Zoning Commission regular meeting minutes August 24th, 2022. Review and file Historical Commission regular meeting minutes July 18th, 2022. A resolution ratifying submittal of a grant application for Illinois Transportation Enhancement Program funds for the Quincy Street slash Riverside Road streetscape project. A resolution of the Village of Riverside, Illinois, waiving competitive bidding and authorizing the village manager to issue a purchase order to Pierce Manufacturing of Appleton, Wisconsin, for the purchase of a Pierce Enforcer pumper fire vehicle for an amount to ex not to exceed 698000 Approval of an intergovernmental agreement between the Illinois Department of Healthcare and Family Services and the Village of Riverside for collections of ambulance fees. Thank you, Ethan. Do any of these items need to be removed by any of the trustees? Hearing none, if I can have a motion. Motion made. Motion by Trustee Galgo. Second. Second. Second by Trustee Marzaka. Ethan. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Gallegos. Aye. Trustee Clarity. Aye. Trustee Marshaska. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. The next thing is the department board and commission reports. Do we have any reports this evening? Okay. Um, I believe we do have two yes. items under that, yes. the announcement of the public hearings. Sorry. Um, first is the announcement of the public hearings of proposed budget for fiscal 2023. Good evening. Before Director you Johns. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I just wanted to announce that on October 20th, 2021, before the village board meeting, we will be ho holding a public hearing for the proposed budget for fiscal year 2023. The public hearing um, is a state requirement um, and um, will, a notice will be in the landmark next week with a draft budget available for inspection next Wednesday at Village Hall offices. Uh, the budget ordinance will be discussed, the budget will be discussed throughout um, October and November with formal action scheduled for December 1st, 2022. Thank you. Um, the announcement of the public hearing of the, oh, you did both of them? Okay. Is there any other reports this evening? Oh, sorry, no, I do need to read the next one. Okay. Um, we do have um, also a public hearing on October 20th, 2022 for the 2022 tax levy ordinance. The state of Illinois truth and taxation law requires that not less than 20 days prior to any taxing body accepting its property tax levies, it must determine how many dollars in aggregate the tax levy extensions will be necessary. The hearing will be scheduled October 20th for the 2022 levy that will be collected in years 2023 and beyond. Notice will appear in the landmark next week. Thank you. Are there any other reports this evening? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to pending business. A, f a first amendment to an intergovernmental agreement between the village of Riverside and the Riverside Public Library relative to issuance and administrative of $1.5 million of general obligation library bonds. Director Johns. Good evening again. <laughs> on June 9th, 2020, the board entered into an intergovernmental agreement with the, the Riverside Public Library for issuance of 1.5 million in general obligation bonds for the lower level library improvements. The library's renovation project came in under budget by $248,817.48. The library has requested that the remaining funds for cap be, be retained by the library for additional capital improvements to the library. The library director and president and representatives are here if you have any questions about their future project. 
Thank you. Would you like to speak? Do you have any? Hi, my name is Courtney Grieve-Hack. I am the Vice President of the Library Board. We are very happy that our project came in under budget. <laughs> um, in some ways, we benefited from the pandemic. Being able to have the library closed meant that we could do the entire lower level renovation simultaneously, um, and we didn't have to close it down in sections, which would have taken longer. Um, the bids also came in lower. So overall, we um, think that the funds that are remaining should be used to further improve the lower level. Um, for example, the great library staff led by Janice has identified additional maker space um, and STEM uh, technology and programming that they'd like to introduce. And to do so, we're gonna in, uh, put some of the funds toward kind of mobile maker space um, units that can be moved around the lower level and have the um, 3D printer, for example, and other really great tools that'll be great for learning opportunities for, especially for the youth. Um, that's just one project that we'd like to um, apply the additional funds to. Um, what's that? Oh, and also we get frequent requests for uh, an individualized study room. So, so a space where people can come and have a closed off uh, area, quiet, separate from the rest of the learning spaces. And one of our um, lower level locations is a closet that's kind of between the, um, the uh, meeting room and some of the lower stacks, it's tucked away. And that's gonna be converted into a study space so that um, people can reserve that room and have a uh, real nice space where they can study separately away from the other open areas. Thank you. Any questions from the trustees? Thank you for everything you do for the, for the village and for the residents. Um, so if I can have a motion and a second. Motion. Make a motion. Motion by Trustee Evans, second. Second. Second by Trustee Galagos. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Galagos. Aye. Trustee Clarity. Aye. Trustee Marshazka. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Motion carries, thank you. Uh, next on the agenda is our continued discussion of our EV charging stations. Um, clerk. Sol, would you take us through this, please? Of course, good evening. So just a couple housekeeping items. I'm on page 142 of the agenda packet if you'd like to follow along. Uh, there is also a map of village parking lots at your seat, uh, which will be helpful as we go forward with this discussion. Um, so a thing I'd just like to start with uh, so we can get it out there is level two charging stations uh, take about 10 to 20 miles of range per hour. Uh, depending on their power output and charge rate. And level three chargers add about 60 to 80 miles of range every 20 minutes. Um, that varies a little bit, um, but that's helpful information. So at the August 4th meeting, uh, the Village Board reached a consensus to utilize a $10,000 grant from ComEd uh, to install a charging station by the end of 20, March of 2023. Um, we discussed locations and types of chargers, but we needed more information to go forward. So the village did some additional research. Um, the first thing we did was we administer administered three surveys, um, one for the entire village, one for business owners, and one for renters. In the village-wide survey, there were 268 responses, 112 uh, stated that they would currently plan or already own an EV in the next three years. Um, those 44% of respondents preferred level two chargers, whereas 35% preferred level threes. And 21% chose that they just prefer to charge at home and they don't see the need or want to see chargers in public. Um, when asked about location, uh, the village uh, residents stated that they would prefer general public and business parking lots. Uh, that received 50 first place selections. The next most preferred uh, area would be commuter parking lots, which finished with 44. Uh, business owners and renters, we didn't receive a lot of responses on those surveys. However, um, some business owners have been hearing from patrons that there are a need for uh, EV charging stations. 
of the 21 renters that responded, only six currently own an EV or plan to own one in the next three years. Um, we also did some research on surrounding EV charging stations in the area, uh, and Berwyn, Westchester, and North Riverside all have level threes. Um, Berwyn and Westchester charge 20, 29 cents per minute for those uh, charging stations. North Riverside and Forest Park also have level two charging stations, uh, which they do not charge for. Um, so what do we want to hear tonight? What do we want to discuss tonight? We want to discuss the level of the charging stations to be installed, the location and number of charging stations to be installed, uh, specifically not only the number we want installed by next March, but also in the future at that given location. Uh, that has to do with the amount of infrastructure we have to provide at the site. Uh, so we would have to redo a lot if we decide, decided to have more later. Um, I think it's also helpful to know that we have about 93 electric vehicles in Riverside. 59 of those vehicles are Teslas. Um, it is hard to tell how many hybrid vehicles we have from our current data, uh, although I assume we have more than 93. Um, and the only other item we would like to uh, hear discussed tonight would be, do we want this to be a subsidized service or a pay service? So do we want to charge residents for using this charging station or do we want it to be a free service? I will note that it is quite common for level two charging stations to be free, whereas level threes are almost always charged just given the nature of how much they cost. With that, um, we have Public Works Director Dan Tabb, who will also answer questions, and David Novak sitting up front from the Village's engineering firm. Thank you. Ethan, could you, did North Riverside, did you say has a level three? Yes. Where, where is that at? It's in front of the Amazon <laughs> Fresh. That's a level two. I use that one. Yes, the level three is at a different location. Okay. I'm not sure where that was. I'll okay. have to look it up. All right, thank you. Yeah. Mr. Tabb? Okay. Uh, to the points that he was, he was asking. So if you always want to go down. Yeah, the, I'll restate them. Yeah. So first we want to know the level of charging stations to be installed. So level two or level three. Uh, we also want to know the location and the number of chargers at that location. Uh, we could also consider a public-private partnership here. So with one of our businesses, if that's something the board desires, we'll also in, be interested in that. And then whether we want it to be a free or pay service. So first item would be level of charger. The gentleman from Christopher Burke, I'm sorry, you're, he, would you give us some background of your expertise in EV charging? Um, would you please? Sure. Uh, my name is David Novak from Chris Burke Engineering, and I head up the um, energy department in the mechanical electrical uh, division, and I work um, primarily with specking out the EV projects that we come across. We have done a number of EV projects um, throughout the years, uh, specifically Chicago Ridge, um, Harper College, Algonquin. Uh, we at Burke Engineering have six chargers of our own for employees to use as well as are out on the uh, network for public use. So, oh, go ahead. so we design you know, work with ComEd and uh, coordinate the installation and construction of EV charging sites. Most of the EV chargers that you install, are they level two or level three? Presently level two. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any questions from any trustees? Anyone, any comments? Mr. Pollack. A question um, for, for the gentleman from Burke. The it looks like there's three cost proposals in our packet. Um, I don't see, and maybe I'm just missing it, I don't see what level those are. Those are all level two. Level twos, okay. And the cost difference is based on how close electricity is and that type and, of thing. And additional infrastructure needs yeah. to be brought in, et cetera. Okay, thank you. I, I, will, I will give you my input since I am the proud owner of a fully electric vehicle for the last three weeks. Um, 
uh, which I've tried to get the village to reimburse me for as part of this uh, study, but they refused. Um, <laughs> I, have, I, I, charge my, I have a level one, and um, I'm basically an outlet. I charge my car in my garage overnight. Um, it, it's not the, the best, um, but it does get me a full charge, usually within 12 hours. Um, I drive, you know, my wife and I make our decisions on who gets the, the electric car and who drives farther during the day. Um, and I make some of the decisions when I, <laughs> I make the decisions to drive farther so I can drive the new car. Um, but the other day I was going to, to Wheaton and um, I had a choice of, I, was, I had to pick up some stuff at Trader Joe's and my thought process was, I'll go to Wheaton and let's see if there's a charger out at the Trader Joe's in Wheaton. And um, I, you can pull it up on your car as you're, as you're driving and there wasn't any there. So I just figured, you know, I'll just bypass that and go back to the Trader Joe's and the Grange on the way back. Um, so I look at these charging stations that are out in the public realm as more um, economic engines. Um, it's something if somebody is deciding to go shopping for, you know, at a grocery store and they have a choice between Tischler's and Brookfield or Riverside Foods in, in, in Riverside. Um, they would say, you know, I can go to Riverside, I, get my, I could throw it in, because a lot of the level twos, they have a time limit. You're only allowed on there for a couple hours, else they start charging you a, uh, um, a idle, idle, idle fees. Because fees. Uh, they want you to get in and they want you to get out. They want you to put in back to your car primarily what you've used. The level threes are supposed to be within a mile of the expressways. Um, so you can get in and get yourself charged up in 15 minutes or so and then get out on the road and, and actually Tesla does say that it's not good for your car to be charging at a level three on a regular basis. Um, so that's, that's my experience. Uh, it's limited, it's three weeks, um, but I've, I've yet to end up on the side of the road with an extension cord asking for somebody to plug me in. Um, and it's worked out, it's worked out very good, so. I think it's important to note too that level two charging stations, if you have a high, or level three charging stations, if you have a hybrid vehicle, you wouldn't be able to charge on uh, level three. So, and also with level level three charging networks, a typical when you purchase an EV, not Teslas, but a lot of charging networks will provide you like free charging for like twelve months or whatever. So if we install the level three charger we might get a lot of like a lot of recurrent customers for that charge and those people from what i read tend to sit in their car for 20 to 40 minutes and they just come back every week or every few days or whatever they need um, but that's just an interesting tidbit so well it, 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 in the tesla there's actually you could watch netflix while the car charged yeah it's 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 pretty wild yeah. um, but any any other yes Ms. Sevens. um I just noticed uh, that the will of business, the business owners for location did not align with uh, the public for where to put the where to put them. They want so it looks like business owners would prefer that the chargers are put in commuter parking, um, where the public, the the respondents that were not business owners, um, would want them closer to the downtown area by the businesses. I was just wondering if maybe we could go back, like when we're finalizing the space, um, we could go back and talk to the business owners about it and let them know that people want to park near their businesses. We, we've had some conversations with a couple business owners already. Um, uh, Peter from Riverside Food has had uh, Commonwealth Edison out. Um, so he's, in, he's, he's already working. Um, through some of the things, and he's going to come to us with a with a proposal. Um, but I, I, I personally, from my experience, I think that again, these are economic drivers to our village, and um, versus putting them in a commuter lot where someone goes in, plugs in on his way to work, and, and is there for for six hours. That I don't think that serves the village well. Um, it serves that person well. Um, and the same thing with, with some of the residential lots. Um, so I, I look at it as an economic thing. So I would, I would, I would my, my thought would be more towards our CBD, whether it's, you know, the Burlington, Quincy area, 
uh, my other thought would be level two, since it's like a two hour, you get, you get the, the 10, 20 miles that you've, uh, that you've used to get to your place and then you, you move on and you, you do your main charging at home. And if you really, you know, if you really need to, to, to boost up somewhere, you can, you can, there's, there's some, well, there's level threes to get to in Burr Ridge and in, in Oak Brook very easily. Everything you have a yeah, I, I'm nodding in agreement with you because um, initially uh, I was thinking that the level threes might attract a certain type of you know uh, automobile owner, a certain type of customer um, that would seek out Riverside as a destination. But in seeing the survey results and seeing who owns what, and that's just in our community, and really analyzing how people make their um, their shopping choices. Um, just the availability of free charging, even people like me who own a hybrid would prefer to, you know, uh, uh, um, patronize an establishment that had the charger available. And I'd like to be able to use it and not be locked out of that by the fact that it's a level three that won't work with my hybrid. So, so I do I have, to, I mean, we, we, we all kind of in agreement that we want to keep it in the CBD area? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, our level two, level three? Level two. 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 Um, we will continue our discussion with, with some well, of the can business. I, yes. Can I please. just ask a question from the gentleman from Burke? Um, Trustee Pollock asked you if you're putting in more twos, and you said presently twos. Are you, are you seeing a trend? We're happy to take a prediction. There is more interest in, in level threes for various reasons, predominantly because of um, the IEPA, Illinois EPA has come out with 80%, um, up to 80% of installation and equipment cost that will be reimbursed on a grant for level two and level three as well as the infrastructure from ComEd to support that. The infrastructure is quite expensive for level three from ComEd side, as well as the charger themselves run in the neighborhood, installed about 150 to $180,000 per charger versus approximately, we'll just say $25,000 per port installed. But it, it, for a level two. But those grants for the level three, I'm, uh, at the IML conference, uh, there was a lady who said, you have to be within a, a mile of a major expressway? They have to be approved, but you know, when you make your application with the design, et cetera, um, that, that's not necessarily the case from my understanding of the new um, grant money that's coming out. And that has to do, I think, with the federal government that is coming out next year where the infrastructure bill that uh, the president signed, that's all gonna be level three predominantly along the interstate system. Okay, so that's the one where you have to be within. Correct. You know, that's where they want you to know, build it out. So when you're traveling from here to Des Moines or here to Milwaukee, you're gonna have easy on, easy off, but you're still gonna have to wait 30 minutes approximately to charge your car. I, I actually programmed my my car to go to Miami just to see what it would do and it was it, it mapped it out and it said you're gonna stop in you know so-and-so Kentucky for 15 minutes and then you're gonna stop in so-and-so Tennessee for 12 minutes and it just it just had it all the way to Miami uh, I didn't do it but I thought it was kind of <laughs> thought it was interesting that it had that kind of sophistication and that there was as many networks out there already and one of the you know the advantage of a, having a Tesla is that there's the Tesla network, which is is much more robust than um, the other level three chargers that are out there for a Ford or a BMW or a, a Chevy uh, Bolt uh, that's currently out there. They can't use the Tesla network. And the, um, being unfamiliar with the technology, it's not something that could be converted over time, right? If we made an election to go for level two and if the technology gets away from us in a short period of time and everybody's at a level three, is it something we could convert or would we lose no. the effort? Um, 
the, there's a big difference between level two and level three. Level three, as um, village president mentioned, you're not supposed to charge your car that often on a level three. It's much for your battery uh, longevity. And due to the fact that the battery is one of the more expensive components to the vehicle, it may cut down on your life expectancy on your battery. So most people currently, approximately 80%, charge at home. Mm -hmm. So most days you're coming out with, a, we'll say, a full tank ready to go. Um, and you're not going to drive the 200, 250, 300 mile range that you're given. So, you know, you're then going to make it back home and, and recharge again that night. You could take advantage of different places around uh, that, you know, to charge locally. And one of the incentives, as the President said, that it does attract people to the downtowns. They like that. It, it seems to be a driver for business um, to you know bring that in. Not so much a level three. Level three is a much bigger unit. It's not just going to be a little stand you know that you can plug in like you see in a lot of the pictures. Got it. I, I'm supportive. I just wanted to make sure I understand. I. I'm not a technologist, but I do know it moves fast, and so I wanted to make sure that we weren't putting in something that's already um, becoming obsolete. I think that if we are being thoughtful about the purpose of this, I agree with the trustees that have spoken that uh, residents here likely charge overnight in their own home, and so the, if, we're, if the purpose is to try to drive, make it more attractive to come to our business district, that's where it makes sense. Um, I'm supportive. I, I am curious how it sounds like you're putting in a lot of these, how long it'll be until everyone has one in it. We've now spent the money and it's not something that's unique or particularly your driver, but it's hard to find a downside in supporting something that is more environmentally friendly. What's really driving a lot of this is the grant money that's coming out from the IEPA. Mm -hmm. Before that, when you if you were to say, do you want to spend 90,000, 150,000 on EV charging and who's going to use them. Most businesses, municipalities are saying, but we'll wait. And now that this money's out there, all of a sudden we have an influx of inquiries, design opportunities, et cetera, that we've engaged in in different parking lots uh, that they're ready to go. It's a matter of the funding. And then once they're, you know, then it's, they'll get them. And then the other component is building out the infrastructure for additional units later. So the big part is the backbone of the how much power do you have in the area mm -hmm. to support additional units later. So then it's just running the wires out to the stand area and hooking them up. A large portion is bringing electricity to the parking lot. So we're, Sufficient power. we're considering a design that would support additional units in the future? Are we? <laughs> I think we're, we're I, yeah. Um, well, I think if we, you know, with the Quincy Street redevelopment, if we get that, we can obviously work that in with that. Um, you know, I think our goal is to continue to work with our businesses to see if we can do a partnership with some of the businesses, um, seek out whatever grant money we can, we can find as it becomes available. Um, I think the goal of tonight was to try to get a handle on, you know, are we, do we want this in commuter lots, do we want this in pub, you know, residential lots, or do we want this in the CBD? And I think we've, we've answered two of the three questions. And I think the third question on the cost, and if we're going to subsidize it, I think that all is going to come down to how the grant money and some of those other, those, some of those other issues is. Is that fair, Mr. Pollack? I would um, suggest that we charge to reimburse our costs, our total costs over a period of three to five years. Um, so we, if we get a grant, that's that much less we have to charge per minute. Okay. If we don't get a grant, then that's how much more we have to charge per minute. But I would see paying off the cap, the, the, the initial investment in three to five years, and then after that, just charging what it cost us to provide the electricity. Thanks. The sevens. Um, I would agree with Doug. I mean, in, in theory, we want to make up our, the money that we've spent. However, 
if I would want to check and see what other municipalities do if they don't charge and we do, they'll just skip our site. Mm -hmm. So to answer that a little bit, level for level two chart, well, first of all, municipalities around us don't do this. Like it's almost all privately, you know, owned and operated charging mm -hmm. stations. We would be the first in this area, the ones I described. <coughs> In North Side, <coughs> Irwin, Forest Park, they're all privately owned. Oak Park has a ton of them. They're all privately owned in parking garages and parking lots. Uh, and then level two charging stations, it's kind of hit or miss. Some charge, some don't. So if we, I would anticipate that if we charge, they would find other charging stations in the area to look at. What I've seen is they start off not charging. For instance, in Glen Ellen, I live in Wheaton, and they started off their first two years not charging, and then they started charging for them, level twos. So if that helps. Can you clarify something you just said? You said that would be the first municipality. Not in the state by any stretch. Oh, I know that, but what, I mean, how, how is, so North Riverside's charging stations are owned by, I know the one at the Amazon is owned by Vol, Voltra. Yeah, well, it's, that's where it's hosted. I mean, Amazon Fresh, or yeah, owns those. Okay, and then they're so on Amazon Volta's network. Okay, so Amazon Fresh is the one that actually put out the capital outlay yeah. for that. And Tesla in August actually, so they never, Tesla never used to let um, businesses charge for level two charging stations. In August, they opened it up where businesses can choose to charge. Most haven't gone to that just because they see it as getting customers in the door. Um, they don't really see the charters themselves as a revenue driver. Um, but they have the option to with Tesla's level two charging stations right now. Okay. The cost to charge is, I think if I looked, is like 20, I think 26 cents a kilowatt hour, something the like level that. Level threes I saw were 29 cents. It's hard, I don't, the level twos vary. I don't have a ton of data on that. Some of it's not, you can't just look it up like gas prices as much. Okay, but at 26 cents a kilowatt hour, uh, how long, I mean, how much, two yeah, hours of kilowatt, how, two hours of charging would cost you? Is it as simple as saying 52 cents or is it? We ran the numbers, if you have a range of 360 miles on your vehicle over, if you're using, you know, for instance, we use the level three per minute cost, it was around $35 to do a full charge. Okay. So at the current gas prices, that's half, if not less. Okay, so the cost, the cost to charge, if you're gonna, if it's gonna be an economic incentive and you're only gonna allow someone to sit there for two hours, it's basically, well, for that one person, but you'd have it all day long. So I, I can see where you're coming from. Okay. Thank and depending you. on the company that, you know, we wanna host the charging stations with, um, they typically take a portion of that from us. So it depends on the agreement we enter into with them. That's kind of hard to anticipate, but. So we're not just getting all of that money back. Okay. Thank you. Very, very good. Do you have enough, do you have enough information to continue your research? I guess that would be a question for Dan. I, I know it's a little urgent considering we need to have them installed by the end of next March unless we do a public-private partnership. We just need proof of expenditure. So. Right. Comment is. <laughs> Even though he doesn't need to shot later. Oh, second. ComEd requires a, a plan of action due shortly, end of the end it's of October. The Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus requires it, but same difference. Right. Um, <laughs> so we have to, in essence, have an action plan as to how we're going to approach this. Because if we do the private-public partnership, we would then turn over the, the grant, um, and then we have the project would have to be completed by the end of March. If we elect to do it ourselves, it still has to be completed by the end of March, but due to the building season, we should start deciding what we're gonna do sooner than later. Okay, all right. So we're kind of in a, a position, do we wanna go down the road of private-public partnership and bank that we will have a business in town um, take us up on that? Or do we wanna forego that and go alone with a, um, a set of chargers in one of our uh, business lots such as the lot on East Burlington because that that be the the easiest one to you know there's no permitting in there it's it's open to, to anyone so it's the cleanest way 
Paul? I would uh, suggest we proceed with at least one charger in the green parking lot because that's most accessible to the public, I think. Um, just for the sake of meeting this, this grant requirements. And the um, question would be, do we put in just one for now, or is it cost effective to do multiple at once? I don't know. But uh, I'd say we proceed with that level two uh, with uh, some kind of credit card charging, like, much like a parking meter. Yeah, the units themselves are fair, you know, the majority of the costs are due to the infrastructure, bringing the power to the site, um, you know, the pedestal for the, the metering, and it, but the chargers are 7,500 to 10 grand a piece. Yeah. I would agree with that. And then we, I, I think we take it a two pronged approach that we, we, we identify one of our, and the green parking lot would be, a, would be a great spot. There's those two spots by the, you know, that are kind of tucked in the back or, or in the front, wherever. We would want to get them as close, close as that, front? Okay. that ComEd line running through there. They have a pole. We yep. most likely put a transformer on, bring power okay. adjacent to that. So it's the, uh, it would be the west side of the lot, the southwest corner. Okay. The most advantageous spot. Um, and and then proposals for two pedestals at that location. So that would be That's two. Four, capacity for four vehicles. Okay. And then I think we, we continue to discuss uh, partnerships with businesses and see if that, how that shakes out. Because we have a couple that have, that, have, that have shown interest. Right. So we'll continue that dialogue also. Okay. I don't think we do. I think, do we need a, no. Consensus, I think, would give them direction. Yes, what yeah. staff will do is hopefully it, we'll yeah. find out if any business has interest in short order. If they don't, then we will pivot and bring back a proposal for the village board to yeah. then formally approve so then that we can get this started pretty quickly. I'd, I'd like to put that out there. We are going to be working on ComEd schedule when we start this process. There is no guarantee we will get this done at the end of March as we sit here now. So I just want to put that out there because as we get into early spring and we're still waiting for ComEd to install their infrastructure to get us the power to the site, you know, we're on their, we're on their schedule. Well, what's the downside of telling ComEd that to start to, 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 that we've chosen this spot? They bring one of their engineers out they have to do a study, their own study, right. to see <coughs> how their network would handle the draw. Then we submit our designs to them, they review it, they have to approve it, and then they come out and do the, the installation of, the, of their portion of the infrastructure. Okay, so what, what's the downside of saying, giving there's, com giving there's comment no down, and go no ahead downside. We can call them up tomorrow and say, this is what we plan on doing. Yeah. Let's start the, the ball rolling on this. But even with that, I don't, I, I can't tell you right now if they're backlogged, or, you know, what the process is. Are you seeing anything? Right. Well, we just sent in an application for level three for another municipality, and that lead time is about a year. Okay. It's, it's much shorter for the, what we're trying to, what has been proposed to do in uh, the Burlington lot, and he's, you know, bringing power off of a pole with a transformer. That's much simpler than level three, but it's still gonna be every bit of three to four months. Okay. So while we go down the path of our own installation, we may want to allow, if we're approached by a private entity, um, you know, I don't know you can handle it how you, you would like, but we may want to still have that money to have another installation within the CBD. Okay. I, if, I, if, I, if I understood Peter and correctly, ComEd has already been out to Riverside Foods. Okay. So they're, 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 they're moving pretty quick and they were actually supposed to have a meeting uh, this week again with his electrician and some people like that. Um, can, does everything have to go through the ComEd poll or can you go off of the person's... Um, well, if he has a sufficient power coming out of his building, that's quite simple. Right. Then it's a matter of a slot in, a, in an electrical panel, and he has sufficient capacity, and you bore a hole through the wall and come exit out into the parking lot and run your conduit wherever you so choose to put it. 
you know, underground to whatever location you want. Typically, they're close to the building right. to cut down on an expense. So that's a quick process. That's simple. You already have the power available. You just need a 50 amp. You just, you just need to put the 50 amp breaker in, and, and as long as your uh, capacity coming into the building is sufficient, and you're not overloaded, they'll do a load calculation, and you know if you're fine, you're good. Okay. Okay, but you wouldn't be able to put like a dual charger on a 50 amp. That you'd only have to do a single. Correct? You can do you can do a dual, okay. and what they'll do is that they will balance themselves so not to blow, blow the breaker. So they will only give out um, like half the load instead of getting 40 amps. You get 20. You'll get 20. Okay. If there's two cars there, if there's one, you get the 40. That way, they, it, it's to save on the infrastructure of how often chargers are being used. They're not always gonna be used 24 seven, you know, eight spots are all taken up. Okay. It's, I, only, I, it's only if there is, then it, it, it helps keep the cost down. Okay, well, I think that, that's a, uh, it's a great way of completing this system a lot quicker um, is to find those public and private partnerships that we can work with to, 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 to tap into. Um, but I still think you should contact Commonwealth Edison and, and start getting the ball rolling for that one because um, we can always say we've changed your mind or whatever, correct? I mean, but yeah, we're, I don't think we're locking ourselves into anything with combat to do a, a preliminary study as far as what would it take to install a transformer and pedestal and all that stuff. Okay. I think that's probably a good thing to do. Go ahead. Just to kind of close the loop. Um, as it relates to the, so let's say we have a business that's interested in partnering with us. Um, would the board still be interested? Because if we, we already overcome the hurdle with ComEd and they're like, yep, you can do it in that, in that location, would we be interested in then saying that's either our location for a level three, especially if we can get grant funding through the state and then we already have a secured location? Or we could also look at doing another level two. I'm just trying to give the board options. I would be inclined to do another level two. Okay. Um, just based on the fact that so many people are just newly coming to the idea of electric vehicles and hybrids, um, you know, I think that the um, economic driver is going to reach more people and have more impact if we offer free charging with those level twos. Um, I am encouraged, greatly encouraged by the um, IEPA draft that they published for their rules on the, on the program. Um, it does suggest that um, an entity can apply for, you know, more than one uh, set of chargers for reimbursement. So if it turns out that uh, with respect to the first one that needs to be installed by the end of March, for which we have this $10,000 grant, that the public-private partnership can move and move quicker than ComEd can get to us to really do that, you know, full study and that we can issue, you know, um, you know bid request proposals, things like that. Um, you know, to, to move uh, for the village lot, um, we can still pursue it if we operate within the IEPA timeline. So it's, it's not a lost cause, and I think we'd um, be serving uh, our business community a lot better if we had multiple chargers here. I would agree. And I, I, I would agree with you, too, that I, I think the idea of a level three, um, it, it almost goes against the economic driver. You want people here to stay for a while. You want them to go shopping. You want them to go have lunch or do whatever. You don't want them to sit in their car for 15 minutes and watch Netflix or play Asteroids and be gone. Um, so um, I think you should contact Commonwealth Edison and get that ball rolling. And uh, we will continue our, uh, our, in, our contacts with the businesses in town and see which ones we can work with. And, and I think if we can try to work where we can get into their, to their systems or their their electric panels that makes all the sense in the world because it'd be a lot less expensive it would be faster 
um, and we could be up and running quicker. Okay, thank you. Everything, everybody good? Doug? Kristen, everyone good? Yes. Okay. Hey, I appreciate you coming tonight. Thank you very much. Dan, thank you, Ethan. Wonderful job. Thanks. Thank you, Ethan. Um, third item is the discussion of the ordinance amending various sections of the Village of Riverside zoning ordinance relative to incorporating a transit oriented development TOD best practices and to make certain other changes. Ms. Monroe. Good evening. Um, so this is, uh, our discussion this evening is related to the second of four ordinances, ordinance draft agenda items that will be presented at multiple meetings of the village board. Uh, there won't be any action taken until all materials and the all of the ordinances have been discussed and updated as needed. I'm going to run through several items very quickly, similarly to uh, the last meeting where uh, I'll just list the proposed changes and leave you to any discussion and, and any questions that you might have. So the packet item starts on page 150 of the agenda packet. Um, the proposed changes that we are discussing or preparing and presenting this evening were uh, reviewed at several Planning and Zoning Commission meetings, but presented to the Planning and Zoning Commission at their June 22nd hearing this summer. So uh, figures one to four A and 10 four three uh, regarding residential bulk requirements are updated for some clarity and, and quality. Uh, language is revised in 10.5.1 and 10.5.3 of business districts to speci specify support for safe pedestrian access, transit access within the B1 and B2 business districts. So remember the, the purpose and intent of this or these ordinance changes are related to transit oriented development um, changes within the code. Uh, other changes are an update to special allowable uses in the commercial and residential charts. Some addresses needed to, and street names needed to be corrected. Subsections A, C5, and the addition of subsection D in 10.5.5 about bulk requirements were changed to include some of those TOD principles. Uh, it specifies storefront window display standards and adds a section to address outdoor dining setbacks in B2 district, so that's the central business district area. Sections 10.5.6 and 10.5.7 related to the B1 and B2 districts. Building scale and design standards, uh, we are incorporating facade design along all four sides of a building, including those along the railroad. Uh, the new section also includes standards for sustainable design and adds bicycle parking requirements. And these, when they're, uh, when they're implemented, would be applied to the new and redevelopment, redeveloped properties. Table six of 10.5.9, uh, the B2 district bulk requirements is amended to add a principal building minimum height of 24 feet, a maximum building height of 48 feet or up to four stories, whichever is lower. Um, it does provide a, a, add a provision for a height up to five stories or 60 feet for planned unit development, so PUD. And yard setbacks are also revised for the standards related to outdoor dining. 1062 for use standards adds language for clarity, includes some updated terms. Uh, 1062F is removing the current 20% limitation. Uh, we apply this as a percentage of linear street frontage in the B2, B2 retail core for uh, ground floor office use. Um, it's replacing that standard with a special use requirement for new active office uses, and it allows above ground office, offices. Uh, they're permitted outright. Amendments to tempor temporary uses in section 1063, uh, identify zoning districts where temporary uses, uh, temporary sales, Christmas tree sales, et cetera, are permitted. Uh, 1073 on accessory structures and uses 
are, is being amended to include standards for fences and walls in business districts. We did not have a distinction between residential and business district for fencing. It adds the temporary membrane structures, tents, and canopy uh, text, and there are also updated graphics. The encroachments table in 1074 has been updated to include minor text corrections, add some regulations and footnotes for outdoor sales and display, outdoor seating and dining, and outdoor storage in business districts. 108, 10, that section on off street parking, uh, includes revisions to general provisions and off street loading regulations. Uh, it also adds bicycle parking regulations and criteria for. Bike, bicycle, moped, and motorcycle parking is appropriate. And the last item is the 1096 10, uh, improves pedestrian walkways in a, inside and adjacent to parking areas and uh, updates a screening standard graphic. So if you have particular questions, I'll let you have discussion. Thank you. Well, I, I think everyone should be aware and, and, and um, Ms. Monroe alluded to this. This we're still, this is, it took since three years for this to get through the planning and zoning. It's not gonna get through this board in three, in, in three meetings. Um, so I, I, you know, this is a lot to digest. Um, so um, I just, you know, we're trying to look at, you know, trying to get some feedback and then the, the staff will come back with some answers um, and, and, and try to, you know, bring this around and, and, and get to a, a good conclusion. Are there any specific items or questions? Go ahead, Mr. I, I, I tell you, I, I'm frustrated by this process. And I apologize for coming off as, as hostile, but I'm, I'm frustrated. I spent upwards of 10 plus hours trying to decipher all this. And to tell me something's being updated, but not telling me how, or tell me it's being updated for TOD standards and not telling me how, I mean, I work with the Internal Revenue Code for a living. I'm used to parsing through cross-references and everything else. I tried to do that here. I couldn't. So if someone asked me tomorrow, Ed, what did you do at the board meeting? You talked about this. What does it say? I couldn't begin to tell them what it says, and that frustrates me. So I, I, you know, I can't even begin to ask a question because after all that 10 hours, I can't even articulate what I'm reading. So I don't, you know, I, several, probably in the first meeting, I asked for a chart. What's the, what was the old language? What's the new language? Why is it being changed? I haven't gotten that. I spent a, a lot of time trying to do that on my own. I had to give up. So I, I don't know what's being hidden. I don't know why this is so difficult to understand. But, you know, maybe it's me, maybe I'm losing it, but I don't think so. So if we can find a better way than to just tell me that something's been updated or something's been, um, you know, amended to different standards, I, I, you know, a resident comes up to me, okay, you amended this to different standards, what did you just do? Or what are you proposing? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, other than telling them we amended it to different standards, I couldn't tell them. I appreciate the feedback. We can certainly address the changes in a different way. Uh, you know, if we'd like to see it in a different format than the redlined ordinance to to provide that in the chart, as you're suggesting, we can certainly do that. Yeah, I, I think a chart would be helpful because the okay. redlining is difficult to follow because there's cross references and okay. it, it's a lot of you know ordinance language that you know, you're trying to go back six sections to figure out what it says. It's just, sure. it's too much. Okay, okay, thank you. I, I, I agree. I mean, not being as, as a zoning person, I, I found this, I mean, I, I delved in this and this kept going and kept going and then Doug asked a question this morning about storage and I'm like, I, I, where is their storage? I didn't even see that in here. Um, so it, it does have a lot of information in here. And, yeah. and, and I, I would like to know what, why some of that stuff. What, what, what was the driver for the storage, mm -hmm. this, the storage? I mean, that was very important. I mean, what, why, why is it yeah. there? Um, what is the driver for some of the setbacks? Um, 
you know, is, are we making, I mean, this is supposed to make businesses come to Riverside easier. Is it easier for a landlord? I think Charlie Pipel did a wonderful job in the preservation. Is it easier to make a landlord go through a special use process for certain businesses, and, but we don't tell him what businesses, he, he, we kind of alluded to it, but what businesses does we don't want? Um, so I, 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 you know, I kind of, I kind of got lost on some of that stuff. But go ahead, Doug, please. Well, partly in jest here. I, I mean, it's interesting. I just found out that tax or that zoning law is more esoteric than tax law. That's probably why he's struggling. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I don't have any issues with. I just have one issue. Let me put it that way. Um, I, I commend the Planning and Zoning Commission. I thought they did a good job with this. Of course, I was on the steering committee that started this process. Um, I think there's probably, I, I'm gonna try to, to summarize in my mind, I think there's three or two main issues, two main substantive changes that are being made here. One is the increase in building height. Uh, the second is making office uses a special use on the first floor. Those, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ashley, if, if those seem to be the substantive issues that affect how people use their properties uh, in all of this. Uh, there's some other minor things, but th that's the main thing. Um, and that is very typical of a TOD plan. Uh, you're trying to create um, uh, a streetscape that is active and alive uh, that thus you don't you want retail uses to have people coming and going more than than office uses do at least on the first floor um, I'm supportive of that but I also realize how difficult that is in today's retail market um, a lot of villages a lot of villages traditionally had that same requirement first floor only retail restaurants in, in your downtown some villages I know are getting away from that because the retail industry is dying uh, and they just feel like they can't afford to be that, that proactive with it. Um, I think the special use approval though allows, is, is a good balance. It allows people to still put offices on the first floor, but it encourages them to, to first look and try to lease to retail or restaurant type uses. Uh, in terms of the building height, um, you know, in the um, B2, this, we're looking at the B2 tonight. Um, it is increasing the permitted building height from three stories to four stories. But we already have uh, the only really new building in the downtown is a four-story building. So we allowed that, and I think that uh, was turned out to be a success. I mean, I think the massing and height of that building is very appropriate and desirable. The extra story adds density, which we want. And part of TOD planning is to have, have more people in your downtown. And so, and it makes it more economic, economically viable for people to redevelop and uh, build a new building. Um, I think that there, there is a provision to go to five stories, but that's only in a PUD and we would have discretion to say no to that. Um, so if anything was taller than the village center building, they could ask for it, but they'd have to prove to us that it fits on the property, that it's not going to create undesirable shadows or, or whatever, and, and they'll have to provide a public benefit for that increased height beyond just compliance with the zoning ordinance. That's what a PUD is. It requires proof of a public benefit above and beyond just compliance with the code. So I'm okay with those two issues. The only uh, thing that I was concerned about in reviewing this this week, and uh, it, you know, I apologize, I should have caught this on the steering committee actually, let alone during planning and zoning, but there's a provision in the permitted encroachment section. Um, it's, you have you know, permanent outdoor sales and display, we have permanent outdoor seating areas, that's fine. But then it also includes permanent outdoor storage for business use. And it says not permitted in the front yard, but is permitted in a side or rear yard. Uh, by definition, that's outside storage that's not in a container, not enclosed 
with the structure, and we do allow temporary membrane storage structures, tents, basically. We also allow uh, uh, container units like a pod um, uh, on a temporary basis. I don't think it's appropriate uh, to allow outside storage in our business districts, even if it's screened with a fence. Uh, if, if a business wants to store extra pallets from their you know, racking system and they want to just throw it in the back of the building, I don't think we should allow that, except on a temporary basis and within an enclosed tent if a business has a need for some reason they're transitioning or whatever, uh, there are provisions that allow them to do that. So I would like to see um, <clears throat> the uh, permanent outdoor storage for business use to be changed to be not permitted in, under any circumstances. Uh, and I did talk to Chairperson Mateo about this as well as uh, <coughs> Assistant Manager uh, Monroe today just to make sure I wasn't missing anything. And, uh, there didn't seem to be any good reason why that got included in the in the draft, so I don't think there's any reasons to leave it in there. But um, other than that, I, I'm comfortable with the, the draft amendments. Um, Don, go ahead. Oh, I was going to ask a question about Section 10 on page 13, Table 6, 10-5-9. Uh, in red, it says 24 foot would be the minimum of the principal building. I want to ask how you got to that conclusion. I'm pulling this up. So, tw well, 24 feet. There, there are some um, predominantly in the downtown and along Harlem. There are a selection of two-story buildings, so mm -hmm. you'd figure there's at least, you know, ten, maybe eight to ten feet for mm -hmm. each building height. Um, certainly, some are hot, are taller than that, but generally, that was a recommendation from the the consultant, I believe, Actually, from, the steering committee. from the steering committee. Okay, so in thinking that it's a reasonable range to have. As a, as a minimum building height. Uh, there's something to be said about a pedestrian scale, and so thinking about one or more stories at a kind of uniform height along a streetscape, um, that was the recommendation for that, for okay. that building height. So if, say, uh, McDonald's wanted to build mm -hmm. one of the restaurants here, mm -hmm. and their buildings are not 24 feet, they would not meet code. We'd have to say, no, you cannot open up one of your franchises here. Is that accurate? Permitted outright. So they would need some other uh, review level, potentially. So there would be a site plan review required. And then as part of that review, there would also need to be determined whether there's either a height uh, variation required or other types of zoning waivers that would be necessary. Do it show hardship, is that right? Yeah. yeah, for a variance, yes. Okay. So just for reference, mm -hmm. uh, Sherwin-Williams, how mm -hmm. high is that? Uh, we checked the site plan. It's 18 feet. So it's less than the 24 feet minimum. Okay. I mean, I, I think yeah. Alex brings up a good point. You, yeah. you, you limit, I mean, I, if, if a McDonald's, I mean, I, I began of going up and down Roosevelt Road and I saw wonderful buildings all along there that I would love to have in Riverside. Home Run Inn Pizza, Giordano's, and they're not 24 feet high. How could they show a hardship? They're, they don't like buildings, not 24. You have to have 24. It's too costly. That's not a hardship. So yeah. we're, we're walking away from some, I think we're putting ourselves in a box we don't need to be because the, these changes are supposed to help us bring businesses, yeah. not, not, not detract from the businesses. But, um, go ahead, Ms. Stephens. Um, yeah, I, yeah I, I agree with President Ballerine. Um, we are putting ourselves in a box. I, but I mean, I first I wanted to thank you for the work that you put into the materials, okay. because I know that you did a, a lot of work just to put this together. And I understood it with a phone call to Commissioner Mateo. Um, so I wanted to thank you for your work. Um, but, and also, yes. Um, if we're gonna, ha it, we can have a one-story business. Um, 18 foot, 18 feet is good. I wanted to know why 
how they came up with the 24 feet. Okay. Doug? As a member of the steering committee, I think I can address that. Okay. Um, the uh, minimum was is established uh, for the purpose of, of streetscape and street design. Um, if you're in a downtown area or in, a, in our TOD area at Harlem and Burlington, um, one-story buildings do not create a streetscape. Uh, in other words, if you're walking down the street, they're so short that you see over the top of them. And to do a proper uh, urban design, you need building height. Ideally, it would be more than 24 feet, but, but the, the steering committee felt 24 feet was appropriate. We talked about requiring it to be two stories. Uh, and one of the members of the steering committee is a real commercial real estate broker suggested, well, if your purpose is just to get building height, just let them do 24 feet if they want to do uh, just a parapet wall that, that reaches that height. They're fine, they're not forced to try to create a second story. They can just meet the standards. And uh, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, but I believe that he uh, believed that was very appropriate for, for Riverside. He was definitely supportive of it. The steering committee unanimously recommended that 24-foot uh, building height. If you stick with, if you allow one-story buildings, you know, think about what you want Riverside to look like. Do you want it to look like a DuPage County suburb, or do you want it to look like a downtown, an urban area that is welcoming to pedestrians, that's pedestrian scale, uh, and that welcomes people walking and biking rather than just cars. Um, and, and I think that's, that's the best way I can describe it is one-story buildings of what you see out in the suburbs or on Ogden Avenue. It doesn't create a pleasant environment for people walking and biking. Um, it's the same reason why we don't allow parking between the building and the street um, because that just ruins any kind of pedestrian connection that a development could have. And this is a pedestrian village, I think. But is, is, are we different between our, between our downtown and between our Hall Arm Avenue corridor? I don't Those think so. I, I mean, they, they're certainly different, and I'd like to see the, um, the Burlington. And that's, we're just talking about, well, tonight we're really just talking about downtown only. But we'll see in the next version. I assume probably the next time we'll be talking about the Harlem and um, Burlington area. We're not doing any zoning changes that would affect Harlem and Long Common. None of the TOD only includes basically the two train station areas, Burlington down, the real uh, traditional downtown and Harlem and Burlington and Quincy. Uh, we're not affecting the zoning anywhere else. Um, and I personally would like to see that Harlem and Burlington area become more of a traditional downtown in its appearance with, with buildings out to the street, with minimum building height, um, and hopefully maybe even some taller buildings at some, port, some point to support the train station and businesses that may want to be in that, that location. But anyway, my point was to explain where the 24 feet came from. It was not arbitrary. Uh, it's basically what a two-story building would look like and what you need to have to, um, uh, to achieve a streetscape, a, a pleasant, in, a inviting streetscape. Uh, and if McDonald's or someone wants to, to locate there, they, they, they wouldn't be chased away. They just have to build a 24-foot building, and they do that quite often. I mean, that's, that's not unheard of for chains to adapt their buildings to the local uh, codes. Well, that you know, I, 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 is there a way we can do a survey of some of our local our local communities, Lagrange, Hinsdale, whatever communities that are like ours, and see what kind of zoning variances have gone be, you know before them, where 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 the new businesses, where the developments are coming from, and see. I mean, th again, 2019 to 2022. A lot has changed. Um, train train ridership has changed. Everything has changed. Things may come back, but um, I'd like to I'd like to make sure that we're not 
we're not in 2023 enacting things that sh that that are little you know are, are are not what we should be doing and and not following the trends of today. Yeah. Go ahead, everybody. I was just going to say, um, with respect to making things pedestrian friendly, um, that is a definitely laudable goal. Um, but I also, you know, I found it helpful to go through these maps that were provided um, following the Preservation Commission meeting minutes uh, that described exactly how many stories each building in each of the different zones was. And then to realize that like in this area that we're talking about tonight in the B2, the current zoning says three stories, 35 feet. And in order to get to what the village center was several years ago, they did have to go through a variance process and they got five variances and a lot of people were very, very upset. You know, the neighbors just felt it was out of scale, um, not consistent with the residential areas leading up to it. Um, and I agree, like I said, with the philosophy that we want to be pedestrian friendly, but is making a 48-foot, um, four-story village center height the given with the potential for a 60-story, I'm sorry, 60-foot, five-story planned unit development in this same zone? You know, what does that do to the walkability and the look and the feel and how do the neighbors feel about that that live in the residential areas and the apartments around there i i think we need to really think about that i'm i'm sunburned because i walked today i walked you know the b2 i walked harlem and you know i was just trying to envision is the, are there proper transitions between existing residential areas and then what's being proposed in these different areas. So I just think we need to think about that piece a little more rather than applying a, oh, here's the you know TOD plan that we're using in all these different communities to Riverside proper. Because you know, while Harlem Avenue may be one animal um, in terms of the traffic and the commerce, and the vibe, you know, the walkability of our central business district in the current B2 is very different. So Thank we need you. to think about the space. Doug. Trustee Barshowski brought up the maximum building height. Um, and I wanted to also follow up on the minimum in both actually. I mean, I actually feel stronger and I think the steering committee might agree with me. Uh, I actually feel stronger about the minimum building height. If we wanted, if people were concerned about increasing heights and we wanted to keep the by right maximum three stories, uh, that would not concern me too much as long as there's a provision through the PUD to go to four or five stories and then they have to prove that it's not a negative impact on anyone and all that. But the 24 feet I think is critical. Think of it this way. Because uh, this is, we're just talking about the B2, so we're talking mainly about Burlington Street here. Imagine the south side of the street, for whatever reasons, all those buildings were gone. Would you want three one-story buildings like are on the north side of the street built on the south side? How would that change the look of Burlington Street? I think it would be, I don't think it would be good. And I, I think that's why we have 24 is, when you see the north side of Burlington, those buildings that were built, I don't know, in the 70s or whenever they were built, uh, especially the ones in the middle, on the periphery it's a little different, like Riverside Foods, it's on the edge and so, but in the center of it, where you've got those three built, one-story buildings <clears throat> on the north side, I just imagine how much more attractive and friendly and, and inviting Burlington Street would be if you had two-story or more buildings on that north side. Good. You know, I, I, on for, for the central business district, Doug, in theory, I agree with you. But how attractive is that vacant lot where that building, the, the pain clinic that got knocked down? I mean, unfortunately, we need to bring in development. And we need to bring in, encourage 
businesses and where people want to shop. You want to get pedestrians, you need to have places where they want to go. So if it's a two-story building versus a three-story building, that's a much different discussion between a one-story building and a dilapidated two-story building that's in need of repair or a vacant lot. I mean, I think that's the perspective we have to have. Second point I want to make is just to clarify you know, what President Ballerine said, you know, we need to distinguish between what's going on in the Central Business District and what's going on in our Harlem Avenue TOD, because I think there's, that's still, I think, open to debate at the board as to what that Harlem Avenue TOD should be. Should that be bringing businesses for sales tax drivers, or should that be, you know, density, residential, and make Harlem Avenue walkable? which I don't know what you would need to do to make Harlem Avenue walkable, but I, I can't get there. Uh, so I just want to make sure those two issues are on the table. But tonight we're just talking about B2. Right. Okay. Okay. So I would also like to know the, 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 logic, between, um, the logic behind a five-story. Like we have our water tower, which is, you know, supposed to be, it's considered the center, the gem in the center of town. And so um, I just have this vision in my head of the buildings, like sort of making it <laughs> seem small. It just seems like that would be counterproductive and just maybe just would rob the center, central business district of charm. I just feel like we need to consider the assets of the center, central business district before we agree to, um, you know, put huge structures up that could shadow, overshadow our resources. I think one, one thing that was helpful is you told me that the village center is 56 feet tall. I think it's 56 feet. Okay, so the maximum would be 60, so four foot taller than the village center that's there. So that gives you a little bit of perspective because someone says, wow, what's 60 feet? Right. I, you know, it's hard to say that. But that gives you a little bit of perspective, but I do agree with what you're saying. Um, you know, I, I think we have an, I think we discussed a lot of different things. Um, I believe Mr. Hannon, um, recommendation would be helpful for all of us because it seems like this is this is a tough thing to slog through. Um, so I, if, if yep. If, if you can start doing some of that. Sure. Um, and then if, you, if, if staff could also start doing some research with, with what's going on around us. How is, how is, you know, how are other villages handling it? How are, what, what development is happening in other village? You know, what has the last three years done to our, done to downtowns? So, and let's see. And I'd also like to know, I, 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 right now, if I was a building owner and somebody said that you can't rent your first floor to somebody without coming to me for permission, I, that wouldn't make me a happy person. Um, so I, I, I don't know if I like the special use, but I, I'd probably have to, to do some more thinking and do some more talking with, with, with smarter people than I am um, on zoning than, than to, to get my head around that. But I just, I mean, if I own the building, um, you know, I should be able, I mean, and, and I mean, I think Mr. Uh, Chairperson Pipel's, you know, uh, statement was right. I mean, and let's just say it's a call center of 50 people answering Comcast, you know, issues. Those 50 people have to eat. You know, those 50 people have to, you know, come in in the morning and get coffee and eat and have lunch and shop and whatever and come to our town. So I, I, I don't, you know, I, I think, you know, that kind of thing is not a bad thing either. So I, I just... I want to know what kind of businesses you're talking about before we before we make them jump through hoops to in order to do that kind of stuff. Um, so does everybody feel comfortable with the discussion we've had tonight? And we'll move on to Harlem at the next meeting. And in the meantime, staff will continue to do some research for us and try to make us all feel more comfortable with all these red lines. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. We appreciate what you and, and Ann have done. It's a lot of work, thank and you. thank you. Um, we move on to new business. Um, a resolution amending the Village of Riverside employee manual and recognize an established Veterans Day as a paid holiday in the Village of Riverside, Cook County, 
State of Illinois. Analysts split. Good evening. Uh, the Village of Riverside Employee Manual was last revised in February to adopt Juneteenth as a paid holiday. Currently, the Village affords the Police Officers Veterans Day as a paid holiday as part of their collective bargaining agreement. In the interest of equity between union and non-union staff, the board is asked to consider establishing Veterans Day as a paid holiday. Please let me know if you have any additional questions. I just can't believe it's not already, so I'm in favor of it yeah. being a paid <clears throat> holiday. All right, can I have a motion? Motion made. Motion by Trustee Gallagos, second? Second. Second by Trustee Marshaska. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ethan. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Gallagos. Aye. Trustee Clarity. Aye. Trustee Marshaska. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Motion carries. Um, next thing is a resolution authorizing the village manager to enter into agreement with core construction and issue a purchase order not to exceed the amount of $58,245.83 for village office renovations. And just as a side note, this is not for my personal office, okay? <laughs> I still have to sit in front of Jessica in the chair. Um, go ahead. I, I will try to be as quick as Ian. Um, so earlier in this year, we began a multi-phased office renovation, which began with the security improvements to the front lobby here, um, the clerk windows, the uh, door between uh, this room and the offices and then the, the entry door up front. We're now moving into the second phase of the renovations, which will be for the um, renovation outside the village manager's office, which will become the assistant uh, village manager's office. Uh, so there'll be enclosures uh, to the current open office, so it'll be a, become a private office. There will be some modifications and renovations to the lighting, the electrical, everything that would be involved in such a, uh, a renovation. The trim, the door, the hardware will all match existing um, trim hardware that's throughout the village, so there'll be consistency throughout. Later this fall, there will be what we are calling the third phase, which would be uh, brought to the board for partition walls, cubicles, furniture, to fill out the rest of the offices to accommodate the new staff that's been brought on over the past year. Thank you. Anyone has any questions? Any questions for Director Tapp? Hearing none, if I can have a motion and a second. I'll make a motion. Motion by Trustee Evans, second. I'll make a second. Second by Trustee Gallagos. Ethan, if you'd please call the roll. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Gallagos. Aye. Trustee Clarity. Aye. Trustee Marshaska. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Motion carries, thank you. Uh, last thing on our new business is Village of Riverside Financial Forecast, Director Johns. Good evening. Presented before you tonight is the Village's five-year financial forecast, spanning fiscal years 2023 to 2027. The purpose of this forecast is to provide the board with information concerning the projected revenues, expenditures, and in changes in fund balance for the Village's general fund. This forecast should assist in identifying areas and opportunities where revenues and expenditures may be adjusted before the final budget is presented. Much of this information and data used in preparation of this forecast has been obtained from internal financial records, trend analysis, discussions with the various department heads concerning short-term and long-term expectations, and external sources such as the Illinois Municipal League and the Illinois Department of Revenue. Several items that I wanted to highlight tonight are the village's revenue sources. The first item I wanted to discuss was the property tax levy. Overall property taxes are expected to increase 5% in 2023 from the final 2021 extended levy, 5% in 2024, 2.5% in 2025, and 1.5 in subsequent years. While the police pension levy is estimated to decrease 2.37% in 2023 and estimated to increase 3% in subsequent years. Wanted to talk a little bit about how the property tax levy is calculated. CPIU is used for the calculation of the 2022 levy was 7%, which exceeds the maximum levy increase for non-home rural entities. This is the first time since the property tax extension limitation law 
or PTEL, um, was required to cap the levy in Cook County since its conception in 1994. The 2022 property tax levy has also been complicated by some of the problems at Cook County's tax billing offices. We have not received a final property tax extension report yet and second, um, prop second cycle of property tax bills have not gone out yet. So the plan is to estimate the property taxes as um, to ask the county for excess of what we think we will get so they cut us off so we don't lose any property taxes on the table. We are estimating our levy um, based on a per the percentage increases in CPIU. Um, if you look at the graph on page 317 of your board packet, you will see that the police pension fund levy in green has increased dramatically since 2011. The incre this increased from 154,000 in 2001 to 1.46 million in 2023 is slightly less than 10 times over a period of 20 years. In previous years, the village has elected to levy the recommended contribution. Wanted to talk quickly about some of our other major revenue streams, including the state per capita taxes or LGDF. We have seen significant increases in the, these collections in 2022. LGDF is made up of income tax, use tax, and more recently, cannabis tax. In recent years, this revenue has been unpredictable due to the decreases due to state budget cuts. So staff has been very conservative in this estimating this revenue stream in future years. And based off trend analysis, is projecting slightly less than what the Illinois Municipal League has put out. Municipal sales tax have also seen a significant increase due to the law change regarding the collection of online sales taxes. I also wanted to mention that the Recreation Department revenues have rebounded nicely since the pa pandemic shutdowns in 2020. The largest area of expense in the general fund are personnel related costs. 2023 estimates include um, 2.5 to 2.75 for union increases. I also wanted to mention that utilities including fuel, natural gas and electricity have seen unprecedented increases this year. Are there any questions about the report or would you like me to get into the items of discussion that I need specific feedback on? Anybody have any questions? Okay. Okay. For the general fund, the past several years now, the village has extended the property tax levy for the Parks and Recreation Department at the approximated minimum rate of 0 .0667 per $100 of EAV. Would the board like to keep that proportion of the tax le levy allocated towards Parks and Rec at 0 .0667 per EAV, or would the board like to increase their levy the same percentage as the overall property tax levy? Can you tell us what the effect of that would be? The increase would be significantly more. I'm estimating an extra forty to 50000 that would go towards the property Parks and Rec fund that would be removed from the general fund okay. tax levy. I will mention that the Parks and Rec fund is one of the only areas in the general fund that does have the opportunity to collect their own revenue at, as a more entrepreneurial department. Okay, and I, and I just, so everybody understands this also is I, many years ago when this was established, we also said that Parks and Rec has to maintain, has to pay for their own capital funds. They, they don't dip into the capital of the, of the village. So they have to save to, to pay for their own trucks, pay for their own equipment, build their own parks and things like that. Correct. And as well as pay back the building. So it's just, mm -hmm. it's just not another $50,000 to go to Parks and Rec. Um, they have capital needs too. So just, just with that background. Mm -hmm. um, any feedback or questions? Just, just to be clear, is this, would be an overall increase in our share of the 
local property tax, or uh, I'm trying to put this in perspective. No, it so would just be taking the it from the general, taking it from the general fund, mm -hmm. and putting it towards the parks and rec fund. Parks and rec <coughs> assignment of the general fund. <coughs> and then once it's, and this is a question, once it's in the parks and rec assignment, it can't come out. Correct. However, the reverse is not true. So if it went into the unassigned fund balance, the board would have the flexibility to grant it to do capital improvement for parks or to grant it to the Parks and Recreation Department. I'll have to have that flexibility. Okay. Plan B has worked for me. Okay. Ms. Evans? Um, I don't have anything to say. I'm listening. Okay. All right. I, I'm just, I do. I. I just was seeing nods. I just wanted to get nods on this side. You had me until we were locked in. Um, <laughs> I don't like being locked into stuff. Um, but I do want to encourage Parks and Rec to come to us and give us an opportunity to allocate that money. I do think our Parks and Rec um, are, are under heavy demand and, and show use and can use those funds for capital improvement. And so I, I would like to make an effort where possible to give them some of those resources, but continue to have it in the, un, in the general fund for that purpose. Okay. Flexibility. Okay. okay. Would the board like to levy the Illinois statutory minimum contribution of 1.192,578,000 for the police pension board or the recommended contribution of $1.468,495? The recommended um, is preferable to increase the funding level of the pension plan. Currently, the pension plan is funded at only 44.25%. We did the recommended last year, is that correct? Correct. The only time we did not do the recommended in recent years was um, due to a conservative budget during the pandemic. And at the end of the year, the board adopted an additional contribution to move up to the recommended. Okay. Recommended. Mm -hmm. Okay. The village board may have, or the village may have a cannabis, cannabis dispensary open in 2023 with the village receiving an additional 3% sales tax. Would the board like staff to present a policy where a portion of that funding would go to pay down police pension obligations? Would we be locked into that too? It would be a policy that the board would have the ability to amend as requested. If we don't specifically allocate it, what happens to those funds? Unassigned general fund. General fund. I like that flexibility. Same. Same. Yeah, I think that's part of a larger discussion of what to do with those in mm -hmm. light of the various infrastructure needs. The board can always make a decision at the end of a given fiscal year to make an additional contribution as we have in the past, too. Yeah. Flexibility. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Currently, the Village of Riverside maintains a $50,000 deductible for all claims with the Intergovernmental Risk Management Agency, or IRMA. Um, the risk management pool offers deductibles ranging from $10,000 to $250,000. The past several years, we have had multiple $50,000 claims, um, but I wanted to bring this option before the board. Can you give us the difference between a 50 and a 25 or a 50 and 100? I mean, it's, it's, what's, the, what's the different costs? It really depends on our claim history for that year. And also, the, the lower the deductible, the higher the rates. Okay. If, if you want me to, I'll put on my, my Irma, Irma hat. Thank you. Um, and so what Irma does when they're figuring out our, our contribution for a given year, they look at our claims to contribution ratio over the last five years and then also look at our different losses. And so then they also assign whether or not you have to pay a premium on top of your base based on where your claims were at. And so what we can do is request from Irma um, what 
potentially we would have seen over the past couple of years should we have moved to a 10,000, 25, 50, 100, or 250,000. Um, the last time we pulled the analysis, um, we were well situated to stay at a $50,000 deductible. And so we can certainly look at that. As you go higher in your deductible, they give you a credit on your um, contribution to the pool. And so I believe, I'm going off memory, but I believe it was approximately 40% moving to the $50,000 deductible. <coughs> And so that's how we've been able to essentially build our excess surplus that is sitting at Irma because in previous years, so prior to 2013, we would utilize that to help balance our budget. So we get that money back from Irma, it would help to balance the budget. And so instead, we've moved to the optional deductible, which has helped. Um, we've had some pretty significant claims. This year, we had a significant claim. And so that claim is going to stay with us for the next five years. And so my my initial thought is we're probably well situated at the 50,000, but we can certainly get that information and present it to the board at the next meeting as to whether or not it, it makes sense. Yeah, it would be helpful. I'd like to see that analysis. Yeah, I, I mean, in the past, I mean, I believe when I first came on, we had $10,000 was our. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. I was, that was my first year as finance director. I bought to the village the option of moving from a $2,500 deductible to 10 or 25. And at that point, the board just jumped right into the $50,000 deductible. And here we are. But it was a great decision because we've been able to build those funds over the past 10 years almost. And those funds are well over. 1.3 million. Well over a million dollars. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think I think we're we're situated, but I think we'd we'd probably do their due diligence. We'd like to see that that report. Okay, but. absolutely. Okay, Ms. Johnson. For the water and sewer fund, typically staff brings recommendations for water rate increases due to changes in expenses like water commodity increase or a staffing change. Would the board like? staff to bring a rate adjustment back effective January 1, 2023 for budgeted staffing changes. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, I, I, because we switched from that, from that $30 infrastructure fee to the percentage, I would like to see how that affects. That's only been into effect for what, six months, maybe? Mm -hmm. That was effective June 1st. Um, I, I agree. I'd like to wait <laughs> a little bit. Like, mm -hmm. I feel like every time I turn around, we have to raise the water rates. Um, and, you know, we did decide to go to the $30 bi-monthly fee. We removed the $30 bi-monthly fee effective June 1st in favor of increasing both the water and sewer rate by $1.50. Yeah, I would like to just wait and okay. see what happens before we can start raising the water rate. I agree. I agree. Mm -hmm. okay. My husband will lose it if <laughs> <laughs> we raise the rates again. For the parking lot fund. In 2022, the parking lot fund is estimated to reimburse the general fund for $106,789 for personnel costs in, and day-to-day -day maintenance of the 11 parking lots. With the potential cost of an electric charging station in the parking lot fund, this fund is going to have very minimal fund balance reserves yet left. However, <coughs> typically we do increase this um, contribution by CPI each year. Would the board like this annual reimbursement to be adjusted by CPI, which is 7%, or by the property tax increase of 5%? <clears throat> Are we talking about both parking lot and, and commuter raising both fees? Or are we stuck with, with we're talking about the amount that the parking lot fund pays the general fund for maintenance of all the parking lots. OK, 
Okay, what about raising the fees in the parking lot? Did, was that That's part of it? That's my next question. Okay. Would you like me to skip to that question first? <laughs> let's, yeah, let's get to that. Okay. Let's get to the raising the fees before we start moving the money. Okay. Um, currently, the parking lot fees have not been adjusted, um, I believe, since 2017. And the uh, parking lot agreement with BNSF lists that um, 150 spaces must be reserved for commuters. Currently, due to Metro ridership being down, we have a lot of unsold spots in lot one, um, since I have to reserve them for commuters. Would the board like to direct staff to work with BNSF to decrease the required amount of spaces required for reserved for commuters? I, I think ridership is fluctuating. I rode the train with Trustee Hannon the other day and we both commented how many people were there. It was a surprise and so my vote would be to give this a little time. I, I just, I don't know what ridership will look like and if those spaces are necessary and I hate to give those up if within a year or two we, everyone's commuting on train again. We're not giving them up though, right? It would be first come, first serve, who's ever on the wait list, whether it be a commuter getting that spot next or someone requesting a 24 hour spot. So right now in lot one, I do have a wait list for 24 hour spots that I cannot sell and no and vacant spaces that are being held for commuters. But a 24 hour spot is like, say someone doesn't have enough parking at their residence or if it's renters, is that what that is? It's a, right. And so I, I do know there's a demand for that. I don't say this casually. I do <laughs> know that there is a demand for that. Um, but once, once that goes, to those spots, if the commuters need them again, it, it, it's, I think it's difficult to pull it back. I will tell you, because I took up, I, I took some pictures, that I have noticed a huge increase of our bike racks, which makes me very excited because <coughs> they were grant funded, so they were a great investment. And so we do have people that, you know, ride their bikes to the train station that may in the past have not done that. Um, it was a nice day. I think it was two weeks ago. I went out and took a picture and all <coughs> the bike racks were being used. And I think that's that was kind of the compelling argument that uh, Karen gave to Metra of, you know, how people are making their way to the train station is changing too. So that's just something to, to consider. Winter is coming. If I understand it correctly, what we're talking about is just negotiating with Metra regarding their required minimum. I would say most definitely do that <laughs> because we could still provide 150 parking spaces to commuters if we want. We're just, we're, we have flexibility. <laughs> well, let me, well, let me ask, let me ask. I, I, yeah. Let me ask you a question. How did you get to the train? I walked. How many it's not February yet. Yeah. But how many <laughs> how many commuters from Riverside, you know, use commuter use the commuter parking lot? That's fair. Do we have stats? I'm just curious, but are a lot of our commuters <coughs> in traditional commuting time, say 2019? Do we have data on whether those are primarily residents or people from outside of Riverside that are? I don't know, um, but I can look into it. We do have that data. We do have the addresses of everyone that was renting at that time, so I can pull that. I'm curious. It's not worth a multi-hour deep dive. No, I, yeah, I agree. It's not worth that, but I, I think it's a good thing to have because you know the re the 24-hour spots are residents. Mm -hmm. You know that those those are our first, you know those are our first responsibilities, our residents. So mm -hmm. I, I I agree with Doug that I think it's we should at least approach Burlington and start talking, see what we can do, and then we can make a decision later. And we cannot charge a resident versus non-resident rate for the commuters, just so that the board is aware because of our BNSF agreement, because the parking lots, the majority of them are on their property. Now the rate. Sure. Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I agree with, with Trustee Clarity. What, I mean, to, tell, to say people walk to the train, bike to the train, you know, let's ask the people that same question in February. Um, I, you know, the train ridership is coming back. I've had the pleasure of riding with Trustee Clarity. The other day I drove with Trustee Pollock. It's a little, you know, potential open meetings act situation every time I hop on the train. Just two. 
Um, but you know, I I, I don't want to confuse the two issues of going to BNSF. Again, flexibility is what we want. Um, I think it's a separate discussion on do we open those spots up. I don't want to lose our status as a train-friendly community. Okay. I mean, we just talked about making it more walkable, making it more usable, and you know, part of that is you know taking the train, walking to the train, using that spot to potentially you know be closer to downtown and walk around. I don't. I don't want to make that residential full-time parking. Well, I think we need a little bit more information on that, what okay. the usage is. Would the board also like to direct staff to work with BNSF to amend the parking lot maximum rate? Currently, BNSF, we have to negotiate the maximum rate charged for the commuter parking spaces and the hourly rate um, at the commuter parking lot as well. The board can elect to increase the residential 24-hour parking rate um, at their leisure. When was the last time that we raised the rate? 2017. We're just talking about asking for flexibility in that we would have to, ceiling, or would we have to implement it? We would not have to implement it. We would do a new uh, or an amendment to the agreement with BNSF that marks the maximum rate that we can charge both for quarterly permits and hourly rates um, and potentially the number of parking spots reserved for BNSF commuters. But, there, but you have two questions there. Right. One is, one is the rate. Rate for, for commuters and the other one is the rate for 24 hours. We haven't raised the 24 hour rate since for five years. We have not raised either rate in five years. So I think we should at least look and see what other, you know, what our neighbors are doing with rates and, and, and be, in that, be in that same ballpark. Because as, as you say, we, we have lots that need to be resurfaced. We've been fortunate enough to get grants for some of that. Um, but we're talking about charging instructions. We're talking about a lot. Of, I mean, a, a lot of our lots need some work. So I would think we'd, we'd want that flexibility. Um, and, and look at um, if we can raise those rates. Is that my? I just think that we need to know what the ridership is and what the demand is because if we can't get rid of the commuter spots that we have at the rate that we're charging, it doesn't make sense to make a special ask, you know, to raise that rate. Um, if you decrease the number of commuter spots and you know, at the same time, then demand for the ones that we have left increases, then that's when you need it. Um, so it's. Okay, I, I, do, you, do you agree? Do we all agree that we should look at raising the rates for the 24 hour spots? Maybe I should break this up into two yes, discussions. Yes, I agree with that. Okay, Take a look. and then I think you need to work with BNSF and, and come back with those answers because their responses to us are gonna make, are gonna drive our decisions. Correct. that all your questions? No. No, we're, we're going back to the, the one about the parking lot contribution to the general fund, whether the board would like to increase that by the property tax levy of 5% or by CPI of 7%. Um, uh, uh, CPI was very high outright, like, you know, statistically and then perhaps an anomaly, I don't know. So it seems to me 5% makes sense, but I do not feel strongly. I, I, I would think we, I, I, I probably agree that we probably should just say CPI, CPI? Seven? Well, I five, no, five, I'm sorry, 5%? 5%. 5%. Five percent. Okay. That was the last of my questions. Okay, well, I have a question for you. Okay. I was looking at the, the different charts it mm -hmm. looks like our vehicle stickers are going down <coughs> price wise it, it that we had spikes and then it and i assume it's because there's a percentage of our residents that don't bother to buy vehicle stickers how do we how could we drive enforcement we did a in 2019 the village did a analysis with the secretary of state for registered vehicles in riverside 
So that year we got more compliance <coughs> than um, we typically see because we were able to reach out. We were able to notify that this vehicle is registered to, to your house um, and, and collect that. We really do sell vehicle stickers based off renewals. We send notices to new tenants that vehicle stickers are required. And then if um, someone is getting a police ticket and they are noticed as a resident of Riverside, then they are also compelled to receive a vehicle sticker. So the village could elect to do another um, Secretary of State analysis next year to increase that. Um, we've also started working with the police department to see if we can coordinate efforts for outstanding police tickets with our um, parking data, um, our parking permit data, and our vehicle sticker data. So those are other ways that we've recently started to try to make sure everyone that has a vehicle that is registered or housed in Riverside um, has a vehicle sticker. Um, another idea as part of the rental registry program is we've started creating um, handouts that we can give to tenants as we're inspecting their units. So we can also hand out vehicle sticker applications <laughs> at that point, um, but it is an application. Okay. And I assume anyone that, re then anyone that purchases a 24 hour per parking permit has a vehicle has sticker. A vehicle sticker. But I, I, I would, I, I, from my point of view, I think, you know, our, our, our vehicle stickers aren't cheap. Um, and I recognize that, but I, don't, I also think it's, it's also unfair for some people not to pay it. So I, whatever tools you have for compliance, I think we should do what we can. Yes, Mr. Hannon. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't think the source of revenue is coming from the renters. I, I, I think there's a lot of residents oh, who are elected agree. to yeah. ignore. So I like that Secretary of State effect where you know it's not just you know telling the renters that they need to pay even more money i like the idea of enforcing people who own in the village to pay what they're supposed to be paying i think we should drive compliance by any means we can okay okay thank you anything else any other questions for director johns okay um, we move on to the trustee reports and communications. Do we have any reports and communications tonight? No. I oh, will let Alex go first. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Trustee Galagos. As you know, uh, fall is well on its way. And as you also will agree that Riverside is absolutely beautiful when we are at peak foliage uh, time. We will have a kayak paddle through our outfitter available to all residents and guests. Uh, that link will be available on the Parks and Recreation uh, probably in the next couple days or so, and there is a cross promotion they are doing with the sand trap. So I would encourage um, you to get out there, enjoy it while we have this weather, while it's beautiful out there. Um, that one week of foliage does not last forever. So it's certainly a sight to be seen. That's all I have. For this. Thank you. Trustee Marshaska. I have two items tonight. Okay. First of all, um, on Thursday, October 13th at 7 p.m. at the Riverside Public Library, uh, the Olmstead Society is presenting a free um, presentation by Patrick Cannon and photographer James Caulfield, who are going to be uh, looking at some of the Chicago area's most distinctive and architecturally significant residents including Riverside's own Coonley Estate, as featured in their new book, At Home in Chicago, A Living History of Domestic Architecture. So it's essentially a walk through the city's 200-year history uh, through different home styles. Um, so you can't miss that. It's uh, a wonderful evening that is planned. Another item that is of interest to residents is that there has been a um, celebrity of unusual stature who has been <laughs> sighted around Riverside at Hopstop, at the Farmer's Market, Tour de Proviso, and visiting our local attractions. Yes, it's none other than Frederick Law Olmsted. He is on a nationwide tour of his greatest landscape designs in celebration of his 200th birthday. Fred's travels have been generously sponsored by the National Association of Olmsted Parks. 
Fred will be visiting Riverside schools in the coming weeks to present copies of the new children's book, Parks for the People, How Frederick Law Olmsted Designed America for Their Libraries. And the Riverside Public Library is also on Fred's list to visit. So if you haven't seen him around town, just keep an eye out. Who knows where he'll be next? You know, I did see Fred on TV uh, stalking Peter from Riverside Foods. I saw him getting jiggy with it at the half stop and then riding his bicycle in promo for Prize. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw him kayaking on the river at some point. Mm. I would be surprised. That would be something. <laughs> <laughs> I did mention he was of unusual stature, right? Yeah. She, she, didn't men she didn't mention that she had to sign out that outfit under her credit cards. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, as you talk about Fred, I, you know, Aberdeen, I, you, you, this was your, I think you called it, I got this crazy idea on the phone. So I think it's been a great idea. Thank you very much for the work and getting it here. It's been, it's been fun having him around. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank Fred himself, um, Trustee Galagos, who, who wore that um, outfit for a while, uh, I believe. Ian, Ethan, Ethan wore it, um, and, <laughs> and you guys all look good in it, and then Eric, Eric from Visit Oak Park, and all of a sudden we had to roll up his pant legs because he's quite small. Well, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that um, our very own Ron Melchioni of Parks and Recreation will be uh, representing or serving as Fred uh, during the school visits. Uh, he's the only one I could get who would get up at that hour. And, and yeah. I'm just kidding. Well, we appreciate no, it was we, wonderful. It was, I really thank everybody who's been involved with the we, effort. We appreciate you bringing him in, and we appreciate you all. For, my for my kids appreciate Big Head Fred everywhere. Big Head Fred. He's cool, you know. Mm -hmm. I've all seen right. a lot of fun pictures on Facebook. All right, with Fred, um, <laughs> the board does not have a need for executive session this evening, so I'd ask for a motion and a second to adjourn. Motion made. Motion by Trustee Gallagher, second. Second. Try Trustee Marsh Osga. Ethan. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Gallagher. Aye. Trustee Clarity. Aye. Trustee Marsh Osga. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Motion carries. Nine o'clock.